Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. You know, you've heard me say uh, throughout the past uh, nine weeks, we're now in, ten week, in our 10th week, but you've heard me say how we, the city of New Orleans, will use uh, data to determine the specific date or decisions that will need to be made in order to reopen our city and protect uh, the public health of our community every step of the way. I thought it was fitting uh, to have an opportunity to uh, have Dr. Vegno provide you with a presentation where you could see the data as we see it and as we analyze it daily, but as we're now shifting into uh, reopening the city, just felt that it was very much appropriate to give the public some insight on the data sets that we look at, how we measure, uh, where we've been, where we are, and use projections as it relates to where we are going. Uh, we have emphasized, as I, I mentioned throughout this process, uh, that we will continue to follow uh, the data uh, as we uh, turn or little loosen up the faucet a little bit. Uh, we have to always be in a situation where we need to tighten it back up and, and immediately should that happen. But again, letting the data drive uh, where we go uh, as a city and with the priority always being uh, public health and public safety. Dr. Vegno will walk through a breakdown of the major criteria we are looking at as it relates to, again, reopening our city in a phased approach and easing the guidelines. You will see uh, what that data is showing us uh, for each of the major uh, gates to phase one, whether it's the testing capacity, which you've heard a lot about that, and even as we have kind of gone even deeper uh, into communities and identifying hotspots and making sure that we're doing everything possible to not only meet our people where they are, but to get them uh, the test and capacity that they need in order to ensure that we are no longer in community uh, spread. Uh, healthcare capacity, uh, ICUs and ventilators, okay? That's also a criteria. The readiness for contact tracing and containment, meaning over the past uh, nine weeks or so, uh, COVID-19 has kind of had us boxed in, you know, as a community, as a city. And as we have um, saw the results in terms of how we are heavily testing, we're moving out of community spread, uh, but we have to have the contact tracing in place so that we can box the virus in. So we're kind of turning that map around. How we've been boxed in over a nine-week period as we move towards reopening, it has to be with the strategy being able to box in that virus to prevent community spread. And that's something that we have experienced very heavily uh, in the city of New Orleans. You know that uh, better than me, not only from the number of positive cases that we've had, but more importantly, from the deaths uh, that we have suffered in our community, uh, absolutely disproportionately affecting the African American community. We know that as well. Uh, with 360 of our residents um, having died as it relates to the black community, uh, 99 uh, residents that we've lost that are tied to our Caucasian community, three uh, residents that we've lost that are tied to our Asian community, and eight uh, that we have lost that are in the category of, of other or unknown. So 470 deaths, you just can't make it up. It's a real number, but they're real people and real lives that were taken from this community because of COVID-19. And that's why the public health uh, of our community will always remain our top priority as we deal with this crisis as we move out of crises to recovery. We also need a steady decline in new cases, the downward curve, and we have been on that path for mighty, for a good while now. We wanna show you that. You'll, you'll learn more about it from Dr. Vagno. Uh, today's update is meant uh, to answer your questions about the data uh, we are using, really, as uh, to guide us throughout this. We'll be back tomorrow. You know, I've said, um, I've scheduled a press conference tomorrow uh, afternoon um, for where we will unveil a comprehensive uh, guidance or guidelines from the city regarding the phase reopening that will commence beginning May the 16th. 
uh, later today, you will hear from our governor, John Bell Edwards, regarding the state level guidance for phase one. And of course, we will be listening and, 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 and learning what those guidelines look like, and we will factor them in uh, to our decision making as well. And we'll give you more again tomorrow. The state's guidance is a floor, baseline floor. It's not the ceiling. So on potential restrictions and safety precautions, we as a city have the right to chart our own course. Again, that's aligned with the data specifically for Orleans Parish, as we also are mindful about what's going on around us in our region throughout the state of Louisiana and neighboring uh, states and cities. Uh, that said, uh, we will continue to work with the governor's office on this, no doubt about it. Uh, the city guidelines for phase one, uh, in some instances, um, will be more restrictive. We can prepare for that. Uh, and uh, specific then statewide, we're looking to give you on tomorrow as it relates to the general uh, guidance from the governor. So we'll go a little bit deeper, of course, as a parish and uh, factor in the guidelines. But tomorrow, let you know what that specifically means uh, for the city of New Orleans. So um, what I will do now, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Vegno, and uh, she will take you through her data uh, presentation. And uh, we will come back around for questions uh, and answers associated with uh, the presentation. And um, I'm going to step out and around and kind of come by you uh, with social distancing, of course. And I know what you're about to see. But I just didn't want you to think that I'm totally abandoning you. But um, this um, next presentation is coming to you from Dr. Jennifer Vegno who is the director of the health department for the city of New Orleans. And thank you again. And Doc, I've touched everything. So it's okay, I just yeah. want, oh good, we do have a, we have some up here. I think the mayor could actually give this presentation by now um, as well or better than I could, because I know she's heard it so many times. But uh, thank you, mayor, for the opportunity to, uh, to do this. Um, you know, during any epidemic, and, and certainly most of us have not been through one before, it's important that everyone has an understanding of infection models and the data with which we as leaders are making decisions. And so what we're, we're hoping to do today is to share the data points um, in a way that, that uh, will make them understandable to you and to the general public because transparency really is our goal. Next slide, please. So here's our current situation. It's actually uh, as of yesterday. Today, I believe we had 11 new cases and two new deaths. You can see from day one, which was March 9th, um, this is real evidence that because of our stay at home mandate and all of the sacrifices that you have made, we've been able to flatten the curve. There's a few curves I'm gonna show you and we've been able to flatten them all. Um, in, reg in the region, so New Orleans, Jefferson, St. Bernard, Plaquemines, uh, we have tested over 7% of all of our residents. In Orleans alone, we have performed more than 30,000 tests. And I never get tired of bragging about the fact that that is more than most countries in the world are able to do right now. Um, as it stands now, about 3% of the tests that we're seeing in our mobile testing, which makes up a large number of the daily tests, um, are positive, which means that Fairly, we are doing a lot of testing, and in the general population, right now from our mobile testing, about 3% of people are coming up positive. So that's a far cry from earlier when it was 20%. Um, with the curve that you see here is our three neighboring parishes, each on, a, each on their trajectory. And I know that's a lot of numbers and, uh, and graphs, but you can see that in Orleans, we had the highest peak and that's the number of cases per capita. This is a weekly total, but we really are all ending up in very close to the same place. And that just, you know, that just highlights the fact that, that our borders are porous. They're not real porous. What ha bo they're not real borders, excuse me. What happens in Plaquemines affects what happens in Orleans. And so we need to really think, think that. Uh, next slide. So when states, municipalities look to what does a reopening potentially look like? We want to be grounded in the best science and the best recommendations as possible. And so we, like others, are using guidelines from the World Health Organization, the CDC, 
the White House gating criteria, Johns Hopkins, and recommendation from our own state Resilient Louisiana Commission. These have helped us identifying in the milestones for the New Orleans that need to be met for us to safely go into a phase one and phases beyond. And I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna talk about each one of them individually. Next slide. So let's talk about milestone one. The first milestone that needs to be met by any region that wants to reopen is a sustained decline in new cases over a period of time. The, you've heard 14 days, you've heard 21 days. The reason for this is because we know that the virus, that an individual infected with the virus can continue to be continue to be infectious for somewhere between 14 to 21 days. So if someone was infected on day one, it might be three weeks before we saw the results, we saw the symptoms. So we really need to give ourselves a lot of time to know if cases are going up and down. You can see our progress. This is a, an average cases over time, so new cases per day. You can see that our first case was March 9th. By April 7th, we had an average, our daily case number was 450 a day. You guys all remember those days. They were not fun days. Since that peak, you can see how much lower we have been for a sustained period of time. So more than 14 days, more than 21 days, it's at least 28 days of a sustained decline. What we've set as the threshold for low numbers of cases is around 50. And that represents a 90% decrease from our peak. And it also makes sense in terms of how much we're testing. We have met that milestone for weeks now. And we will continue to monitor this very closely every day at all of our testing locations. So this is something that we will need to track. Any spike in cases or a consecutive daily increase will be a cause for concern and a need to push the brakes and, and decide whether or not we can continue on the path we're on. Next slide. The next milestone is testing capacity. And so that's been set at the ability to test four to 5% of our population every month. For New Orleans, Orleans Parish, that's somewhere between 500 to 600 tests every day. As you can see, again, these are averaged out. We have met this milestone for quite some time now. And that's because of a lot of reasons. Our healthcare facilities now have internal capacity to run tests on multiple different machines and are doing a large number every day of folks that enter into their facilities. For the city, we have started our, we started with the drive-through testing and we have continued with our mobile testing sites which are doing at least 250 tests per day and we're about to add to that number next week. So right now, we feel very confident that we can hit that and that's thanks to our partnership with LCMC, with LSU. Um, Oshner is also doing some mobile testing. So everyone has skin in this game. We will continue to operate these intentionally in neighborhoods that have the least access to traditional means of testing for as long as we can possibly keep it up and as long as our supplies uh, continue to be robust. Testing is absolutely critical to ease restrictions because this is the mechanism that we can quickly identify any spike in cases. If you are a region that's not testing enough, you will never know your spike. Next slide. Milestone three that you've heard a lot about is contact tracing. This is a protocol for identifying quickly individuals who have tested positive. And again, we're in a much better situation to do that. It's not taking seven to 10 days to get test results back. It's taking 24 hours or less in many, many cases. So we can find people much quicker than we could before to figure out what sort of monitoring they'll need and to work, walk these individuals through the isolation that will be critical so that they do not spread the virus. As you know, the, the state is hiring a team of hundreds of contact tracers who will be charged with contacting newly diagnosed patients, tracing the individuals with whom they've recently come into close contact. So a sustained contact of 10 minutes or more within six feet. 
By the end of the week, they expect to have an additional 200 from what they have now and 700 by June. While our phase one restrictions will continue to limit most high risk close interactions, this is going to be crucial to preventing widespread. And it's important to know, like, just like early March, we're going to be going back to a situation where anyone who is in close contact with someone that tests positive for COVID will be quarantined for 14 days. So this is important for individuals to understand. It's important for businesses to understand as well. This is why it is so important that everyone will have to continue to social distance and wear face coverings in public. My face covering prevent, protects you and your face covering protects me. So Eve, we are both wearing face coverings and one of us tests positive. There is a much lower likelihood that that will be a significant interaction. Next slide. Milestone four is assuring adequate capacity in our healthcare system. This is a very busy slide and I apologize for that. Um, what it's telling you is that our number of COVID patients, and this is in region one, has in hospitals has gone down significantly even as the number of cases goes up. This, the squiggly lines are ICU capacity and you'll see that we in region one are the blue top line. We have right now a very robust capacity within our ICUs, within our hospitals. Um, we have adequate PPE, but this is again something that we will be tracking very, very, very closely. If a spike results in another surge in hospitals close to what we had in early April, that will be a very, very concerning sign. And then our fifth milestone is to ensure sector specific guidelines for operations are in place before we ease restrictions. Again, these will be based on best practices identified by CDC, Johns Hopkins, White House, and our own Resilient Louisiana Commission. It will allow some individuals who cannot work remotely to get back to work while still protecting them and the public from harm. And that's a point I wanna emphasize. If you are able to sustain your livelihood by working remotely, you should continue to do that for the foreseeable future. Next slide. So I want to, I want to explain sort of, a, I'm gonna explain in just a minute some other a little epidemiology, right? Epidemiology 101. But what I want everybody to understand is that right now we are meeting all of the criteria set by all of the governing bodies and all the guidance that we have, and we should be very proud of that. That is only because we have been so patient and successful it, during the stay at home mandate. Other regions in our state, as you've probably seen, lag behind, and that's concerning both for them and for us, because again, we are not isolated on an island. We know that COVID continues to spread every day, particularly as more folks enter in public. We also know that there are events that have been identified that are very high risk. You've probably heard about these super spreader events. These are events that orders of magnitude raise the likelihood that many, many people will be infected by things that are innocuous, a wedding, a birthday, a convention, a large church without any spacing guidelines, large meetings, places where large numbers of people gather, where there's lots of surfaces to touch, and there's very little ability to social distance. Um, you know, just to put an example on it, South Korea recently relaxed their restrictions on nightclubs and bars. One individual went out on the town to multiple locations while he was positive. They have now linked 40 cases and thousands of others who need to be quarantined, quarantined from that one person. So whatever guidance we put out, we really need to think hard about making things like this continue to not be allowed. Okay, um, next slide. Now we'll get into the epidemiology, sorry. So this is something you might have heard of, it's called the r naught. It's defined as the basic reproduction number of a virus. Many, many, many diseases have r naughts. Flu, do, flu does, measles, yellow fever. It's used to illustrate the number of infections that are estimated to stem from one single case. It is based on the characteristics of the disease, and it's also modified by human behavior. 
So without talking about human behavior, we know that COVID-19 has a high r naught or reproduction number because how easily it spreads from one person to another and the fact that our entire population until this year was susceptible. There was no immunity to this disease. When you add in what we've done with social distancing and hygiene practices, this r naught this reproduction number, decreases and we see significantly fewer hospitalizations and deaths. So an r naught of one means that if one person has COVID, they spread it only to one other person. If it's below one, that means that we are doing an excellent job of suppressing the virus and it is not running rampant and we are not overwhelming our healthcare system. We're region one right here. This is something that the epidemiologists have been tracking since day one. And you can see in the very beginning, before we did the stay at home, before we changed anything, one person with COVID was infecting two other people. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot, the difference between one and two people, but I'm gonna show you in a second why it is. Right now in region one, we are exactly where we need to be. We are suppressing it through our measures. And this gives us confidence that staging our reopening is the right thing to do right now. You can see that not every area of the state is quite there yet. Next slide. So this is what it means in real terms. There is a tremendous difference between a reproduction number of one, where one sick person infects another sick person, compared to a reproduction number of two. In this basic comparison, after this, this is a seven week timeline. We're assuming that one person is going to take seven days to affect, infect someone else or two other people. Seven weeks is not a long time, but at the end of it, if we're saying this is 100 people and they give it to another 100 people who give it to another 100 people, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of seven weeks with our R, R not less than one, we would have 700 cases over seven weeks about 15% of our cases are getting hospitalized, so it would be about that many hospitalizations. And right now we have a death rate of 7%, so that would result in 45 deaths over seven weeks, which is still a lot. But if you look what happens when, if we go back to where we were before social distancing, before masks, before all of our stay at home, the difference is between 700 and over 1,200 the difference in hospitalizations and the difference in deaths. This is a potentially overwhelmed healthcare system. This is not. This is a crude example, <laughs> but I think it starkly shows how important each of our behaviors and actions will be. We can continue to stay on this side and not that side by wearing a mask in public, staying six feet away from each other, washing our hands op often, frequently disinfecting surface surfaces, and not going out unless it's essential. Next slide. So what we're calling phase one is safest at home, which means for many of us, that's still the best place to be. The goal is to safely and slowly reopen so that we can successfully do phase one and not have to go back. We have an added responsibility in New Orleans because the burden has been so great and it has the potential to be greater. What we're saying is we physical distancing, as I've said, will remain in effect for the foreseeable future Everyone must wear face coverings when they go about their business. We've said this before. I think people are starting to get it. I love that everyone in this room is wearing a face covering. They're all very nice and colorful, but we need to continue to encourage our friends and our relatives and everybody we know. Elderly and those with serious chronic medical conditions who are at greatest risk of hospitalization and death need to still stay home. What we want to do is look at those low risk businesses or those that might be medium risk with modifications, those we are expecting 
to open at 25% of their capacity and size, size limits with very strict other guidelines about sanitation and distancing. Those sectors that have high super spreader potential, and I mentioned some of them, cannot reopen safely. Next slide. Is that the last slide? Um, you know, data and numbers help us understand the big picture. I hope this has been helpful. But every data point on these charts is a person in the community that have been, has been impacted. 470 of our family members and neighbor, neighbors have died from COVID. In two months, it has become the leading cause of death in our state in two months. We know that many cases and deaths start from a seemingly normal, harmless ritual of daily life, a birthday party, a night out, a wedding, a funeral, a meeting. We have all either lost someone or know someone who has lost a loved one from COVID. Don't let, our progress has been phenomenal, but we can't let our guard down now. If we go into phase one cautiously and safely, we won't have to go back to where we are now and we can continue on to phase two. Going back would be even more devastating than shutting down initially. So that's my presentation. If you guys have any questions or need clarifications, I'm here to answer. So Johns Hopkins really has put out the best guidance of this and they, they categorize types of businesses by the contact intensity, the volume of people and the ability to mitigate. So a retail store could be low risk if it was easy to put in physical dividers, everyone was wearing face coverings, and really the limitation of the number of people is critical. Also removing all common areas where people gather, right? So you go down the aisles of a store, you take something off, you don't, maybe you do or you don't get to go into the dressing room. Again, a lot of this is gonna be industry specific. You go in a line, someone is behind a glass shield, you check out, and that would be a low risk. Any, any business in which you have a prolonged contact between individuals for a good amount of time and you're not able to modify, right? Think about a wedding. You, what do you do at a wedding? You hug and you dance and you get close to each other and it's really impossible to modify that. That would be a high risk. So Johns Hopkins, again, has a number of different um, sectors. We are awaiting the governor's guidance. Um, the Resilient Louisiana Commission has put out a lot of what they, th you know, they have categorized low, medium, and high. And so we are really looking to them um, to make sure that that also fits with what we think would work in New Orleans. So it depends. I, it, it's we could get into the details and the weeds, but it really it really is going to depend. And again, there's going to be broad categories, and even within a broad category like retail, there might be a lower risk retail or a medium risk retail. The state fire marshal is going to put out very specific guidelines that is going to try to bring all that risk level to about the same, but some might have to go a little further, right? And so we're again we're looking to their guidance and then we're gonna make sure it, it makes sense with what we've been doing. Um, and in some cases we may need to go farther and in some cases we might not. Right, so that's another document we're waiting for. The state is um, going to be releasing their guidance for businesses as a regards to contact tracing in the next several days. And so we anticipate um, that most of the burden will be on the individual and the contact tracer. Um, we do expect that if it is a high intensity contact business, there might be some, some more requirements of them. Um, but as soon as I have those, they'll be made public.
Yeah, I believe that's something that um, the governor is likely going to talk about later today. Um, but again, you know, as we know, churches can be modified um, very stringently. We certainly do not want to create a situation in which a church becomes a super spreader of it. <laughs> oh, you're not going to trap me with that one. Um, I think, honestly, you know, that I think that's something that NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball are all looking at right now. If you look at what's happening in South Korea, they're playing baseball to empty stadiums. Um, right now, large venues are um, are very challenging. And so Saints season starts in the fall. <laughs> we'll have to see what it is. But I think that the I think that. The NFL and the NBA and all of those organizations um, are going to make the best decision. Um, they certainly don't want to be the source of any infection. And so it'll really just depend on what things look like then. So that'll be a, a state um, recommendation. So whether it will be a mandate is, I'm not quite sure. Um, that it will be the strongest recommendation, and then you know I'll await guidance on what their their legal team says. There there certainly are communicable diseases that exist, like tuberculosis, in which quarantine can be mandated. I'm not sure yet if COVID is going to be one. But yes, we are looking at options for individuals who might need a place to go to, to feel safe. Um, you know, we already have one of them. We've got the Bayou Signet facility that's the state running. There's capacity there. Um, we're looking to see what will happen with the convention center, if that might be another option as well. I think that they actually um, closed that one because testing got so quick. Um, that was for people who were waiting their test results, and now there's really much less waiting, so there really wasn't as much of a need for it. Well, it has to be safety first, but it's pro-business in that we don't want anyone, any of their workers or customers to get sick. I don't, that wouldn't be very good for business if someone came into a business that was unsafe and then got sick. Um, also, I, th I think that the, dev the economic devastation of opening up too fully and then having to pull back would be worse than where we are now. I mean, you can just look at countries that are doing this. You know, if, if South Korea opened their nightclubs and then had to sh they just had to shut them all back down. So that's folks that get rehired for a few days and then are laid off again. Um, that would be catastrophic. If we do phase one well, then more businesses will be able to open more fully. I know that that is something the governor is going to talk about, um, you know, and, and maybe it'll just help to sort of clarify indoor versus outdoor seating. Certainly there will be strict restrictions on indoor seating, table service. How you are being served will look very different from New Orleans restaurants of old. Why outdoor is a little safer with, again, very strict distancing, right, not tables crammed up next to each other, um, is because we know that the, the virus, it's harder to transmit when there's open in open air. Indoors with ventilation systems, there's a lot we don't know. And so it's better to be far more spaced out indoors where we may be able to allow um, more individuals to sit outdoor. Again, we're waiting for the state guidance, and we want to see what that looks like and figure out if there's any, any need to modify what they're going to ask businesses to do for Orleans. Okay, see you guys tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> Thank you all.